Hi, I'm Gina Gordon, instigator and host of the Arts and Letters series, where we discuss words, the arts, ideas, with mostly local authors and artists. Welcome to Arts and Letters. As the Art Presence board member in charge of all things books and local authors, I am really excited to add to the Arts and Letters Zoom series a few conversations about the art of memoir. Our community is lucky to have many artists and writers telling their stories and sharing their art. On July 9th, Kristen and I will talk about the word memory itself, how we remember, what we remember, and how our memory changes. My favorite quote about the subject of memoirs is from author Anne Lamott. She says, write your story. If people didn't want you to write about them, they should have behaved better. Tonight, we begin a conversation about the art of writing memoirs. Kristen Lore Weber is with me. Good evening, Kristen, and thanks for being my memoir conversation partner. Hi, Kristen. Um, hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi there. So I'm going to keep Kristen here with me, but I am going to share a few thoughts before I open the floor to, to her to talk about her view of memoirs and a little bit about her process. What is a memoir? What is the difference between a memoir and an autobiography? Let's begin with autobiography. The Oxford Dictionary describes it as an account of a person's life written by that person. That's it in a nutshell. In my words, it's an, I was born, we did this, and then we did that story. It's a chronicle of the life. Here's an example. This is an autobiography called A Lucky Life. We produced this in 2016 for an author in Carmel Valley. <clears throat> Ken wrote this in his 80s and 90s in Carmel Valley. It is 100,000 word chronological account of all his days from childhood in England to a life of service in the Navy, and then a colorful career as a steward on board several ocean liners. He retired in Carmel Valley after a third career as a high school English teacher. It covers his own teachers from grade school through high school, his favorite foods, his children, his first and second wives, etc. It is very detailed. There is a formal timeline, a family tree, and photos of Ken from the crib to retirement. Here are the first two paragraphs from Ken's preface. When attempting to remember episodes or periods or one's words and actions and exchange between individuals, the mind wants to recall particular people who were important in the past. It is like looking at old photographs and notebooks. Time has faded the image and the words. At my 89th year today, I pieced together what once was one day following the next, which became a week, and then a month, and even eventually a year, and became my life in dates and times. Of course, happy and tragic times and momentous incidents are available in the memory and are indelible in the memory, like an echo or an image. I hope I have recalled friends and those who loved me and especially the angels who appeared, perhaps fleetingly, or were pivotal in some way to solve an impasse or open a door I thought was shut. That to me is a true uh, autobiography. Uh, a memoir, according to Oxford, is any nonfiction narrative writing based on the author's personal memories. To me, when someone says something like, something is based on memories, it is less a description of a then we did this and then we did that, as it is a story often with a theme or a moral. It might describe a moment in time during which the author learned something or changed or grew or grew up. Here are my examples of memoirs with a theme. They happen to be written by me. They are basically about the love of cooking. My first cookbook, which I'm not showing you tonight, was a simple celebration, which I wrote for the Chopra Center for Wellbeing in San Diego in 1997. It is a cookbook about the Ayurvedic lifestyle written for Westerners using Western ingredients. It was a fun book to write and I learned a lot, 
but I never felt like it was my book. It was their book about the program, using my recipes and my research about Ayurveda in the kitchen. I longed to write my own cookbook based on my notes from 30 years in the business of feeding people. I started by organizing the myriad boxes of memorabilia that I carried around all those years. I sorted through all and wound up with 15 bankers boxes categorized by decade. Some decades took up two boxes. In those boxes are reams of mini legal pad notes about ingredients, recipes, and alterations. Scribbles on cocktail napkins while I furtively parse the ingredients of somebody else's salad dressing in a restaurant. Pages out of gourmet and Bon Appetit magazines. Pictures of me with myriad other chefs and staffs, menus, dreams, and ideas. A lot of pictures of food from piles of fresh ingredients to platters of delicious meals. While in this process, my imaginary muse tapped me on the shoulder and whispered, don't forget your mother's binders. I dug those out of a storage box, 12 red leather binders embossed with my mother's name and the food category such as bread, baked goods, and desserts, or meat, poultry, and fish. These binders were a gift to her from her father in the same year we, my mother, brother, and I, moved back to Bonnybrook Farm while my father went off to Korea in 1951. I'm telling you this for a reason. This is how a memoir begins. I laid out all my mother's binders on the kitchen table. As I flipped through the binders, I found and remembered all the foods from my childhood, fresh baked bread and cinnamon rolls, soups and stocks the original green goddess dressing. I also found remnants of 50s cooking like white sauce made with Campbell's cream of mushroom soup or dressings made from Durkee's famous sauce. I wonder if anybody else remembers Durkee's famous sauce. You'll have to send me a note and let me know. So, but mostly I found all these gems worth remembering and sharing to save for my childhood for my, and for my children if they're interested. And I remembered that cold winter at Bonnybrook Farm. I was thinking about making up a story about my mother's cooking and the life on my grandfather's gentleman's farm in Ohio. Then the amuse arrived again. This time her voice was louder. She grabbed me by the collar and practically dragged me down the hall to a closet, pointed at a shoebox wound up with black electrical tape. The muse, shouting in my ear now, said, you don't have to make anything up, it's all here. And so I opened the box, which contained my parents' love letters of that very year we were on the farm, 1951. Letters I deemed too private to read in the 25 years since my parents' deaths. I spread them out on the table and I read them. Wow. And that is how Honey Baby Darlin, the cookbook series began with Bonnie Brook about that year. Here's the first few paragraphs from the Bonnie Brook in the fire-warmed kitchen of Bonnie Brook, Flossie and Bessie provided an abundant table and oversaw the keeping of the big house. Lincoln managed the garden and the coop. Back stairs above the kitchen wing, their rooms were at the top of wide, glossy white steps, which climbed around the west end of the kitchen. At the east, in the foyer, rose a curving staircase with mahogany banister, excessively carved and polished to a dark gleam, down which I actually did slide once. It did not end well. My favorite quote from that era is a letter from my mother, from, to my father, that says, little Ginnabel, I was three, is fine three square meals a day and a couple of cookies, and she's a happy girl. It takes bravery to write a memoir, digging deep into the good and the bad, the right and the wrong, the epiphanies. I chose to write about food because it has been and is a major part of my life, beginning with Virginia's devotion to the kitchen in the 50s. And the thread that weaves it all together are those letters between two people in love, separated by war and oceans. 
Then my scope broadened for the gingerbread farm, which is based on 20 years in Carmel Valley on my own little farm, where I grew veggies and I cooked and I fed Miriam Bohemian neighbors in the 60s and the 70s. And I developed my first business, Jenna and Company Catering. Again, those bankers' boxes came in handy. I immersed myself in those boxes for material. Both books have about 150 recipes, lots of pictures and stories about the love of cooking honed over years of experience. Here is a letter from my father to my mother on, the, on their anniversary in 1959, the day that the gingerbread farm begins. June 1959, my own. I always have the feeling that something extraordinary should happen on our anniversaries, some planetary event. I watch for bursting rockets or shooting stars, winged angels flying out of fluffy white cakes, because I am sure the heavens are as glad as I am that we are married. But tomorrow, nothing unusual like that will happen, and it is just as well. What will happen is much more desirable. You will smile at me. I'll wake up in the morning and you will be beside me, and you would do that for no one but me in this world. Jenna and Mark, and Mark will knock on the door for homework help, new ribbons, shoe polish, any minute, the car keys. Jess will wiggle his way under the covers for a snuggle, and soon enough, the car keys. The fact that such things happen every day is what makes life so sublime. You are so fine so decent, so pleasant, mornings before coffee, the exception, so loving and lovable, I respect you for your intelligence, your ideals, your principles, your integrity. You are all that matters, and I have the privilege of making you happy, your fortunate husband. <clears throat> the third cooking memoir, the guru years is based on the next 15 years of my cooking career, which took me all over California preparing food for teachers, gurus, and retreat centers. It's unfinished. Novels get in the way and another subject altogether. The guru years will emerge sometime, maybe, in 2022. Although they are chronological, my stories are less about the order and more about learning and growing as a cook and as a nurturer, memories of different eras, food choices, and growth as a cook, and a love story. So Kristen, will you come back, talk to me, and talk to me now, or and all of us, about your experiences uh, with the art of writing memoirs. Jenna, thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me to share this time with you. Um, and thank all of the rest of you for coming to experience this about memoirs. I, um, I wrote my first memoir when I was 17 years old, and it was basically the story of my relationship with my high school sweetheart. And he had gone off to the Air Force, and I was about to go off to the convent, and the priest said to me, you can't be writing to a young man who's in the Air Force if you're going off to the convent. And so um, I talked with him and I, I begged and finally he gave in that I could write one more letter. So I wrote one more letter and it was the whole story of my relationship with this, this young man who was now in the... Uh, in the Air Force. And I've been writing stories ever since and memoirs ever since. Um, I have like four initial lessons that I've learned from actually doing the writing over all of this time. And that's what I would like to talk a little bit about tonight are these four keys that I use when I'm, um, when I'm working on a memoir. Uh, the first one came from my mother, who was also a writer. She always wanted to write a memoir. Uh, she never did. 
Um, she was too busy doing other things and writing other things. She wrote for the, the local newspaper. Um, and her first lesson to me was write in your own voice. And I'd like to read to you out of this memoir that I wrote about my mother, my convent sisters, and myself. And her lesson has to do with having words in her fingers. That's the way she put it, for having her own voice. After she died in 1993, I put my letters from Mama in plastic page savers, organized them by date, and stored them in a black loose-leaf notebook. It's here, by my chair, on the bottom shelf of the bookcase. If I begin to read a letter, my mind calls up her voice. I don't do so often, not because I don't want to hear her, but because I do. And the pluck of her words upon my heart vibrates a cord that is never severed. The words are in my fingers, my mother used to say, and her words collapse time. Instinct warns me that by following the trail of her words, I will walk the path not only of her life, but of my own, especially of the path I took in and out of a Catholic convent. Do I even want to make that journey? Does it matter what I want? Must I follow it regardless? The word is where the dance is. Maybe if I follow her, we can dance together upon this trail. I must remember that and fear neither her voice nor mine, despite the carefully hidden truths those voices can uncover and reveal. This reminds me, Jenna, of um, the quote that you read by Annie Lamott. That is so, that is so good and so true. It and it's, it's that worry that stops me the most often, you know, like, um, what are other people, is this going to hurt them? And she just takes care of that, just, just, like like that. Now, some people never write their memoirs because they don't consider themselves writers. And um, I think that that is where this rule about using your own voice comes in. Because people have this massive variety in the way that we take in and structure and remember our experience. Reproducing a memory has equal variety. We speak it, we dance it, we draw it, we paint it, we write it. In all of these, but for me, most especially in writing, we have to go way down into our memories, to the source of what we are, so that the words come from something in us more fundamental than our minds, so deep that, in my mother's metaphor, they seem to arrive on the page directly from our fingers. A most recent experience of having words come from my fingers is uh, happened to me just last week in um, the latest memoir that I'm writing. And um, this, so this is the first draft. This is hot off the fingers. <laughs> in March of 2002, the phone rang and my sister's voice on the other end was trembling. I need you, she said. Can you come? Once again, I stepped out into that space, that nowhere between worlds, instantly, shorter than an intake of breath had happened. The choice had been made years ago. 
the first time I saw my sister in her bassinet coming home from the hospital in War Road, Minnesota, where she had been born. Dad and Mama in the front seat of the car, she and I in the back. You take care of your little sister, Mama said. And there it was, the choice, gladly, eagerly, jealously almost. Now she was dying. I would go to her. Nothing could stop me. I would go to her. And John would stay home to take care of our little dog, Momo. One doesn't even ask the questions that cannot be answered. How long? What if? I would go and he would stay. He and I had gone together the day after our wedding less than a year before. I would go alone this time. Who could tell what I might need to do? How love might occupy my time, my focus? He would stay. I would go. So the words in the fingers using your own voice. Second, when you're writing, it's really important to be writing something you can't help but write. Hmm. Natalie Goldberg says um, in her book, Writing Down the Bones, go for the jugular. <laughs> it's really hard to do. It's, it's, uh, it's scary. But there's an urgency in this. That means the experience you remember has power and it feels complex. How can you ever put it together in a way that makes sense to anyone else? Maybe it doesn't even make sense to you, but it was so powerful when it happened that you were changed by it, or you felt that if you wrote it, you could die. Maybe you could go to hell, or others would be changed or they might be angry or would suffer and die or life itself, pretty grandiose, life itself would be changed. But what if we need to dare all this because there is an event or a person that had that kind of impact and you must find the words that are strong enough and beautiful enough, or even devastating enough, to reconstruct that memory that changed your life. That same young man who went off to the Air Force when I went off to the convent um, showed up again, not really, but in my mind, in the convent, uh, very soon after I entered. and. This is from the book. Uh, it's his memoir. It's a memoir of John Weber. And, um, and in the convent, the novice mistress um, was going to take me to task for his presence in my mind. The convent incinerator room smelled of fire and waste. The sisters crushed cans underfoot, dumped them into barrels quickly, holding their breath. Whatever could not nourish or no longer had a use found its way into the fire. Bones from the slaughtered sheep, feathers from plucked hens, remains of our long hair sheared to the scalp on a day called reception of the veil. Mother Anne, the novice mistress, sent me to the incinerator room to think. After sacrificing your home, your parents, your children, the ones you might have had, and especially the love of this young man, would you allow his picture to come between you and your divine spouse? Go to the incinerator room and ponder the fires of hell. I had confessed to hiding his picture 
in a corner of my trunk. Who will you choose? The old nun's round, wire-rimmed glasses magnified her eyes. Jesus or the picture of that boy? How many other women had stood where I stood, holding the treasure they could not let go? Did they lift the door to the fire and see hell? Or did they see those embers at the bottom, light glowing through the waste, galled and gashed as the poet sighed, gold vermilion? A divided heart will break. I held his picture in my hand and stood half an hour thinking of snow, of three pines reflected in Wabanica Creek, of morning rising over the lake, of the velvet upholstery in his 1938 Plymouth Coupe, of the door closing, of opening the door, of my feet running after him, of his arms, of goodbye, 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 of the sound the Plymouth made driving away, of my steamer trunk filled with memory and desire, of promises. A divided heart is already broken. I let go. John's picture fell into the fire. The memory, the memory uh, that one puts into a memoir, it must haunt you. It's required almost that it haunt you. It must be a question or a mystery that you have not yet answered or solved. This is another aspect of the buildup of energy that is needed to complete a writing project. Something beyond what I know or am aware must be pulling on me. It wakes me at night. It seeps into my dreams. It might be a line from a song that won't go away. It doesn't matter what your topic is, your mother's one-of-a-kind recipes, or the anticipated death of your spouse. The story is best if the writer is compelled to figure something out. When I married John Sack, my third husband, and also a writer, he suggested I write a trilogy called My Last John. Or I thought three husbands might be better. The biggest mystery lay at the feet of my first husband, the Catholic priest, Patrick Kelly. It's a memoir entitled The Root of Beauty. The line from the Lara poems. Can you see? Yeah. The heroic life is the root of beauty. It draws together you and me. Well, as it turned out, it drew us into paradox. Of all my memoirs, the one about Pat Kelly is the most haunted and the most haunting. I keep hoping that when I'm finally finished with the trilogy of memoirs, I'll have discovered what all that haunting was for. He died, Pat did, at 55, long be before I could figure it out. The haunting fell right into the crater of his death. Eventually, I would need to face the whole of my life and memoir writing would become a necessity. This is from The Root of Beauty, and it's from uh, a period, the part right before he died. We already knew he, he, we already knew he was dying, but we'd only known that for like two weeks. Fear 
can liquefy our bones. We go to set down a foot and the ground has disappeared. A hand trembles and the coffee splashes from the cup. All of this transpired between Easter and Pentecost, which we celebrated with the poor Claire nuns in Ridgefield. I'd been blessed with good friends there and they circled us with their loving calm. On Pentecost, one of them took a picture of Pat and me with Sister Bernadette. I look at the picture now and I wonder how it had not confirmed the prophecy in my dreams of his death. I see it there now, death, a dark and terrible beauty softening the recesses of his eyes. And then a thought from that about memory itself, which we'll be talking about in July. Memory is deceptive. It bears only the faintest resemblance to what we call the facts, the actual happenings, the external details. Life, for all our attempts to capture it for exactly what it is or was, passes through our awareness in a dreamlike manner. Memory is a magnet drawing together what was actual with what we hoped would be real, repulsing what we feared and what we refused to accept. The choices made as we attempt to sort out memories, accretions, identify each of us and form the content of our story here in this earthly existence. Our reality though is the deep ocean made up of everything alive with all we do not remember influencing our every breath and heartbeat affecting our health or lack of it concealing if we dared to look the very face of god finally the key is to stare at what you've written until you see the connections from the beginning to the end. Amazed in the beginning, anchored in the middle, coming round again at the end to finally understand. It can help to look at memory through the eyes of yourself as a child. And while I was writing these other books, I also had an internet blog called Mary Jane of the Lorelands. These episodes that are now in this book um, somehow contributed to the other books that I was writing. And I began to see those themes going through these episodes. There's a spiral-like scene in this book towards the end, returning to my grandmother's resort on Lake of the Woods the first eight years of my life, the location of the other stories in the book. On my return there in my 30s, I, want, I took Pat Kelly with me. I wanted to, him to see how my life began as a child. On a day in the early 1980s, Pat Kelly and I visited what was left of the old Klimix Lodge not much. The lodge itself had been torn apart. Sections of it moved and turned into cabins. Much of it just tossed out as trash. Pat and I wandered an unfamiliar landscape. I think this is where the ice house used to be. And there once were beautiful rocks down there on the shore. One was like Crystal and Mary Jane, that was my name when I was a child, and Mary Jane would pretend to be inside it, following the fissures like roads into the interior. We walked toward the woods where Grandma Klimix daisies used to grow, the big tree where Mary Jane's swing hung. Gone. Where was the spot she buried that baby chick? Where did she dance around the grave of Sparky the dog? The earth had reconfigured itself. This is also or is this also what becomes of us, 
the individuals who occupy a space. Are we as ephemeral as the land we once thought to be secure? So stable and steady that even if everything else changed, the land would remain. And then it doesn't. There is something more here than one stunning notion that we can't go home again. Better is T.S. Eliot's insight that we can go home again, but only after long explorations and then in the keen sight of a life intensely lived, we can finally know the place, the essence of the soul for the first time. We walked the forest's edge. Maybe it was the wrong time of year for wildflowers. Leaf green and deep red of sumac curtained the interior. Pat was pointing, look, look, a spot of red almost hidden in the long grass. Too round to be a sumac leaf. What? I went towards it. Whether it had survived or returned there every time a spirit of innocence ran laughing at the forest's edge really didn't matter. Whether it had belonged to Mary Jane, a true archaeological find, or to a succession of individual children over the years, these details rarely matter to the heart. I laughed, feeling I'd found a bit of her, a round of color in a shaft of summer sun, a child's red ball. So, Jenna, that's so, it. Uh, I have a question for you, Kristen. You are a very prolific writer. Uh, do you find that you write, do you have many different themes or do you kind of, do you have a theme that seems to keep showing up and that you write about over and over in different stories? What is the thread of your themes, your your various themes of your, how many, five memoirs that you've written now? Five memoirs. Um, in, in, the, in the memoirs, the thread is paradox, I think. Um, it's, it's starting off in one direction and ending up someplace else. Um, it's, it, there's, a, there's a big theme of loss in in my memoirs because that's been a big theme of my life um there's also a big theme of love that it always seems like the loss that i've experienced in in the many parts of my life those those losses have always um seemed like blessings in the end sort of i mean i know that seems odd but because paradox is at the core of everything the loss calls the almost the trauma of the loss calls for the next blessing or calls for the next thing that's going to happen the next part of my life that now as i look back because i it's a long ways back now but um yeah. i can see how if a lot of people say this if this one thing hadn't happened then the next thing would never have come it couldn't Mm -hmm. It's like the one draws the next one into into my life as it leaves. It's like mm -hmm. pulling a wagon and the next thing is on there. So th those are, but, oh, something I should also say is I don't know those things before I start. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm going to write about. I very often start with a line that comes to me in my sleep and I have no idea where it's going. That happens even more in the novels. When did you first start writing? I didn't think that I could write um, decently until after I was in the convent and um, I wrote a term paper on the Divine Comedy. And all of a sudden I I realized that there was something bigger than it, than what I'd been thinking about before to write about. And that's when I really first started. And then I started writing little essays. 
but I didn't start thinking about writing as as a um, book project or something very large until I was working on my doctoral degree and had to write a doctoral dissertation. And I had so much fun. I wanted to quit my job. I wanted to spend all my time just sitting at the typewriter, which is what we had then. This was back in 1980. And I just, all I wanted to do was write. So um, that's what, and then that book, my doctoral thing, it got accepted for publication at Loyola University Press. And suddenly I knew that not only did I like to write, but I probably could. And did, did you leave the convent before you went into this study program? Or was it, how uh, long, I guess the I, you know, study? yes, and I guess I'm yeah, interested the, in how long you, you have so much life and passion in you. And I just wonder, and I know everybody else wonders, and this is kind of a personal question, but how long did you stay in the convent? I stayed in the convent for 14 years. And then wow. I was married to Pat Kelly for 10 years. And then I was married to John Weber for 23 years. And then I've been married to John Sack for 10 years. And so is John Weber the writing. John Weber of your from the, early life? From high school. Yeah, that's a really neat story. They're all really neat stories. <laughs> <laughs> And so uh, uh, D David asks, what was the subject of your dissertation? The subject of my dissertation was, um, was let's see, how can I put At the time, I worked um, as a chaplain at, an at Catholic Charities um, at, a, at a home for disturbed, emotionally disturbed children and families. And... Um, and I needed to know more about that. So I entered a doctoral program, which was a professional program. And my dissertation was how to uh, work as a team community with these children who were in so much pain and so much suffering. And um, so the name, the name of the, what I named my doctoral dissertation was um, uh, When the Bow Breaks because I wanted the symbolism of what happens when a family breaks and the children fall. And, um, but what Loyola Press named it was Caring Community, because they wanted it to be a professional book that would go out to all the people who had to be, who were called to be chaplains in institutions such as that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so I'd like to go back for a moment to your, your the, the, part of your talk about writing in your own voice it's because it's an interesting subject to me as an editor because writing memoirs is entirely different than well and even a, as an editor for s many of the books that I have worked on there there is a certain style and it's the voice that you know may not be grammatically correct but it's the voice and so as an editor, I have to really kind of get out of the way of the story in order to really be a good editor. And in fact, when I'm first starting a book to edit, I read the whole thing before I ever touch a word mm -hmm. because that allows mm -hmm. me to get inside that person and inside their voice and kind of wrap my arms around the big picture. And then the second time through, then I, I, I'm very careful about it. But I, I guess the question is, how far do you go with your voice? Uh, you know, is there a, is there a sort of place that you can feel really comfortable about whatever it is you, ha you have to say, whatever voice it is, whatever language it is, whether it's foul or funny or mean or hurtful or, you know, how do you, how do you kind of manage that voice? And the other question, which is kind of part of the same thing, is do you feel it's necessary when you're writing a memoir to, if you have something to say that was difficult about a person, 
do you tell that person that you've written about them? Um, Two very different not questions. Always. <laughs> not always. That's why I like Annie Lamont. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, but, I guess um, that's why I asked because really you, you shouldn't really care because they should have behaved better. <laughs> I have a very hard time with with that. Like I said, I have a very hard time with with um, in the in the book about Pat Kelly. I tell a, a situation which I've been had been keeping a secret from everyone until I wrote that book. I, I felt, but it was my problem. I just didn't want anybody to know that. I didn't think, um, and but it was so necessary to the book. And he's dead, and so I I wrote that scene into the book with as much compassion as I could. And um, that's one of the things I think that the the key here is. Uh, is ego that either as an editor or as a writer if I think that you should write everything first that comes to you you know first of all you mm -hmm. should just lay it all out there and then when you go back before you even get it to give it to an editor I think you have to throw your ego away and you have to look at that and say did I write this because I want to be startling or I want to be intense or I want to show something really, really fantastic that happened to me or even if it hurts somebody else in the telling. Um, those, I think that's what you throw away. And that's how you know. That's how you know, either as an editor or as a writer. I remember my, my first um, really big time editor with Harper, uh, Harper Collins, when my book Woman Christ was was uh, being published there, and um, she said to me that it was she was the head of the editorial department for the religious part of of Harper, and she said to me that it's really hard to train editors, new editors, young people. It's really hard to train them into giving. Um, giving up their own idea of how this book should sound um, because they would like to write a book too, you know, and and they would want it to sound like their voice. So it's very, very hard to teach people to do that. And um, and that's the ego. So that that's the thing that you have to give up, both as a writer and an editor, in going back and looking at, at the book yeah and saying I, how can i best, I how can i best bring is, this person's voice forward yes and and also to that it that a memoir is not a place for you to bash people or to get your no. own uh rants spewed or you know to to argue a point it's really telling a story and and how it affected you and how you that's grow. It. And that's the bottom mm -hmm. line to me. That's what makes a memoir different than an autobiography. It's about growing and and little epiphanies and the things that opened your eyes. So I mm -hmm. I, I guess I, I, I did, I think it is true. And I think that it's, if we write with compassion, uh, you know, yes, the truth might be Kind of an irritant but really no one gets hurt if you write from a totally compassionate point of view that's right that's right i so, believe that yeah so we have a couple of minutes left is there any final thing that you would like to say to anyone about writing or writing a memoir um would you like me to repeat Anne lamont's <laughs> quote <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, I, I would like to say that, um, 
I have, I have begun to understand not only my own life, but the life of those people who have given me the great blessing of their love and their presence throughout my life, that I know us all better from having done this thing. Uh, I know us all better. And, um, and I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful. Great. I guess that's it. And I'd also like to say yeah. hello to my son, Jeff Weber, who I just saw <laughs> his name down here. Yes, great. <laughs> Uh, yes, that's that's exactly it and beautiful. Uh, uh, Tara asked me to please, yes, repeat the quote. The quote is, write your story. If people didn't want you to write about them, they should have behaved better. <laughs> but I do I think that, that there is, the, I love it too, but I also want to always say it, that if you're going to write and you're going to write about other people, to do it compassionately and to write about your own growth and, and what you learned and what made you a better person. And I want to say one thing, may I? May yes, I say one thing about do. compassion? Yes. Um, I think it's really important to, to, tell, to tell the truth with compassion, yeah. um, not, to, not to make it sweet or something or to leave out things that are important to the narrative. Mm -hmm. but to but to understand if you can how people came to do what they whatever it was that they did that you that you want to be compassionate towards yes and that's what gives you the compassion is that you you get it you understand it right because we're all just beings trying to do a good job and we make a lot of mistakes and things happen we sure do mother <laughs> ann used to say even a saint sins seven times a day. <laughs> Thank you. That's fabulous. Thank you so much. I really love working with you, Kristen. And I know everybody loves it when you're with me. So let's do it again. We will see you on July 9th. And we will be talking about memory and its truth and its lies in our heads. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. And everyone have a really great weekend. Thank you so much.